And beyond machine to machine communication like chatbots, you have the Internet of Things too. And so, how are chatbots going to talk to things? How are they going to talk to chairs? How are they going to talk to your car? And I believe that XMBB is a very good, you know. Now, what does that mean? That means are all of your chatbots compatible to XMBB? Do you have turnkey systems for your chatbots to communicate via? XMPP. And these are some other standards, communication standards, voice standards that I've been coming across and I'm not even sure yet how to get chatbots communicating on these standards. How will my machine talk to your machine? Why not the same way that I talk to you? We already know that most chatbots use XMPP, Extensible Messaging and Presence Protocol for Communication. And why shouldn't they? After all, most people are also using XMPP-based instant messaging for online communication. Of course, it remains to be seen whether or not XMPP will become the lingua franca for machine-to-machine -to -machine natural language communication, in effect an open protocol for communication among intelligent agents. The problem here is at the moment there is no good bridging technology for instant message to voice and back and I am voice bridge with or without avatar. My belief continues to be that XMPP is the lingua franca for chatbots, allowing them to communicate with other network systems, including avatar systems, and indeed with one another. I can imagine XMPP being involved at this level for interfacing modularized avatar systems, not to mention the potential convenience of XMPP for interfacing cloud intelligence with hard bots or physical robots. Comet is a web application model in which long-held HTTP requests allows the web server to push data to a browser without the browser explicitly requesting it. Comet is an umbrella term encompassing multiple techniques for achieving this interaction. And this has to do with push and pull of uh, web feeds. Free switch is not really a standard. It's a free and open source communications software for the creation of voice and messaging products. But I believe that free switch uses. I'm not proposing standards beyond voice in my opinion on XMPP and APIs for instance. Nor am I proposing my process, any process for determining standards. At this point I'm simply trying to increase awareness and stimulate debate. Modularity is a design technique for software composed of interchangeable components. Mindstorms. That actually I was thinking what kind of image can I use to symbolize this concept that I'm trying to get across and mindstorms came to me but in researching this uh, presentation that I read that Mindstorms was a cooperative project with MIT. I didn't know that, that MIT and uh, Lego got together to create the Mindstorms. The Lego Mindstorm series of kits contains software and hardware to create small, customizable, and programmable robots. Mindstorms kits are also sold and used as an educational tool, originally through a partnership between Lego and MIT Media Laboratory. The educational version of the products is called Lego Mindstorms for Schools and comes with the RoboLab GUI based programming software developed at Tufts and using the LabVIEW as an engine. LabVIEW is one of the programs that I've looked at. I've been looking for AI middleware and LabVIEW is one of them that I've looked at, Mathematica, MATLAB, others, others like that. So what does modularity really mean? I think in terms of frameworks and libraries, it means for me customization and personalization by users. 
The second graphic there is Yahoo Pipes. I'm a great fan of Yahoo Pipes. I love Yahoo Pipes. And a lot of people, they just give me this blank stare like, what is Yahoo Pipes and what do you do with it? That it's called a mashup platform, but it's actually a mashup platform for data, primarily web feed based data. And I call it more of a visual middleware. It's a cloud-based middleware. It's a free middleware right now. The problem I'm having with it specifically is limitations on uh, throughput. It has just certain performance limitations. It's not enterprise grade. It's not really production ready. But it's, it's just a very handy thing to be able to program visually. And it's got some very interesting components. It's got a web service component, which what you can do with that is you can access any API on the web. So what that means, you, any API, any RESTful API, you can use to process your data with. And there's just, every day, there's more and more APIs on the web. It also has a YQL module, which is Yahoo Query Language. And that also allows you to program all kinds of things and go out, for instance, to webhooks and create your own webhooks online. Mainly, I use, I use it for Twitter bots. I've been, I've got a lot of Twitter bots. I love Twitter. I've been, I've gone on and on about this for other people. I was trying, last night, I was talking about what I was doing. I was parsing questions off the top of Twitter. But then what I'm doing is, I'm trying to find the answers for these questions on Twitter so I can just make this nonstop continuous question answer system. But, you know, there's all kind of uh, problematic issues with performance involved in that. But it's been a really interesting experiment, and um, Yahoo Pipes have been very helpful in doing that. that one, thing I, one thing I characterize Yahoo Pipes is I call it a de facto reasoner or rule engine, because you can also use rejects in there. There's rejects modules. So that means you can set up any kind of rules you want to process these feeds in any way you want. It's just remarkable. Modular chatbot frameworks will help to enfranchise a broader base of users. What I'm seeing now are app stores, but they're beyond app stores. We know what an app store is, but we have iTunes, we have iPhone, you know, where we can buy apps. We're starting to see Android app stores. Well, there's a new breed of, of services coming along that are API stores. And so people are selling APIs. They're selling functionality in these online marketplaces. And this is contributing to this cloud robotics scenario. My Robots is, is one example of selling, you know, API functionality, you know, in a marketplace that you can use in your, in your robots. Strong Steam is another example of an API store what they're selling artificial intelligence apps so you can you can buy and sell functionality and you can mix and match this in your own development there's another one big one called MashShape. MashShape is a more generalized api store and they do have a certain amount of nlp apis available on MashShape which is, is very interesting because we're talking about a whole nother level of functionality available to people in the future. You know, also vision, computer vision and, and recognition, you know, popping right out of your computer, just mix it, match it into your, into your bot and even through cloud robotics, port it over to hard bots. It's all, it's all possible. There's a different set of API stores, too, which are data-based API stores. And what those are is examples are InfoChimps and Kasabi.com. And what you do is you provide the data. For instance, you have any data. You have a knowledge base. You have a list of nouns, any kind of data. And they run the API. They're going to have what, maybe a standard API interface, which accesses your data. But then that's metered. And that's another way to monetize your data through, it's just a different kind of API store. So instead of providing the API yourself, they provide the API and you provide the data. But it's another 
way to monetize. This is one of the newest things that I've come across, and I just had a conference the other day. Fiona. Fiona is more than a, uh, a middleware. It's a framework. Let me read what I have here. Fiona is a project of the Spanish company Adela Robots, makers of physical and social robots. Fiona stands for Framework for Interactive Services over Natural Conversational Agents and is subtitled Sparking Together. The sparks represent individual contributions. There will be both free sparks provided by the company as well as commercial sparks provided by developers. For example, Fiona will have both free TTS and commercial TTS sparks. It was described to me as a collaboration platform, both a marketplace and a middleware. Sparks may be contributed in C++ or JavaScript. There will be three main environments, development, store, and production. They have mentioned the involvement of companies such as Nuance and Accenture. Fiona is designed to be a cross-compatible between virtual and physical robots. Adela Robots is a, is a physical robot company. Um, it will be launched in three stages, April 2012, September 2012, and final launch is scheduled for June 2013. The April launch will only be open to 50 concurrent developers. That's next month, 50 developers, C++. And you make your own Sparks, and the Sparks are the modules. Fiona will attempt to mod monetize cloud robotics. Not only will there be transaction credit for sales of your Sparks, but once in production, there will be ongoing royalties also from the Sparks that you create on there, or the contributions that you, that you make. Case studies, cloud robotics, Apple Siri, IBM Watson. I didn't know until I started uh, preparing this presentation that Siri stands for Speech Interpretation and Recognition Interface. One of the interesting things about Siri and Watson is that they both have in common the use of nuanced speech services. Both Siri and Watson will use cloud-based ASR. And that's the new Watson, the commercial applications of Watson. Siri uses over 35 APIs. This goes back to the mixing and matching and the Legoization. That's how Siri is based on APIs. But Watson, as a different system, it has 41 subsystems in Watson. And that includes semantic web technology. So that's incorporated into, into Watson. There is talk of both a forthcoming Siri SDK and one or more Watson APIs. They're talking maybe different Watson APIs for different verticals. We know that Siri is hosted in Apple's new iCloud data center in North Carolina, so that goes back to the cloud robotics. Personalization is just another word for customization. That means roll your own. Open chatbot standards for a modular chatbot framework. On the right, you'll notice my Second Life avatar. That's Ralph T. Time. The potential of porting existing virtual reality technologies into the new world of augmented reality is heralded by the introduction of Google Glasses at the end of 2012. Well, that means if you've got bots developed in Second Life, that you will be able to port those over into augmented reality. And people are talking about that these Google Glasses have the potential to even replace mobile phones. Now, remains to be seen if they'll do that, but people, what people are talking about is if you can wear something, then you don't have to walk around with your phone and stumble into things and fall off the end of piers and stuff like that, and that people will just love to wear this stuff, so we'll see. In summary, I'm encouraging everyone to keep in mind open standards for a modular chatbot frameworks within the context of cloud robotics for both virtual agents and physical robots. I cannot stress enough the importance of the conversational interface in general and to the coming Internet of Things in particular, including voice to machine and machine to machine natural language interaction. In short, 
there is much to be optimistic about for the foreseeable future. Identification.